Hi, I'm Bill Walker. My guests today have described small cap equities as a stock picker's Disneyland. Here to elaborate on that statement is the management team of Trimark Small Cap Equity Funds. Rob Michalachki is head of small cap equities for Trimark Investments, and with him are the other portfolio managers on the small cap team, Jason Whiting and Virginia Au. Rob, so you, you normally don't hear the word Disneyland and investing in the same sentence. Can you explain what exactly does it mean when small cap equities are referred to as a stock picker's Disneyland? Sure, and, and the first thing you need to understand is there are 40 times more small cap companies in the world than there are mid and large cap companies. So really the, the depth, the breadth, and the variety of businesses you're able to choose from are, are just significantly greater. You know, you go to a typical amusement park and there's two or three feature rides and everybody's lined up at that for an hour long to get on the ride. You know, you go into Disney, you've got four parks inside Disney. Each park's got six, seven, eight, nine feature rides inside of it and it's just a more pleasurable experience. And, and that's the way it is investing in small cap stocks and businesses. Just a more pleasurable experience, more variety to choose from, better choices to make in the end. And Virginia, let's elaborate further on that Disneyland theme. Um, you know, how, how does the size of your space potentially benefit you and ultimately investors? Yeah, well, just to put some numbers on that quote, um, in the world there are 40,000 companies, publicly traded small company that are, have market cap under $3.5 billion. Compare that to, you know, mid and large cap with only 2,500 companies. Um, in the U.S. alone, there are 7,700 small companies. So this is definitely an area where a stock picker can add value. And, and Jason, you know, I think some people would suggest that the analogy is because of how scary the rides are. But a lot of people are saying that small caps are risky, volatile. So would you say stay away from them now, or how would you respond to that sentiment? Yeah, I think the, the main thing we have to consider there is, is volatility risk. And we don't see volatility as a measure of risk. If you need your money out of a, a mutual fund, a small cap fund, in the next six months or next year, then absolutely volatility is a measure of risk because there's a chance the market, the small cap index, whatever, could be down 20%. But if you're really in it as a savings product, you know, for your kids' education, um, for your retirement, and you're in it for the long term, volatility is absolutely not a measure of risk. In fact, it's an opportunity because we target the right companies from the, the Disneyland analogy, and, and you can find these wonderful firms. Um, the fact that they might go down 20 or 40% is just, that's the opportunity to buy them at wonderful prices and then hold them for the long term. So we see volatility as an opportunity, not as a risk. The way we look at risk is permanent loss of capital, sort of avoiding bankruptcies, major blow-ups, buying things at hugely inflated prices that you'll never recover when that multiple comes off. So that's how we view risk as a permanent loss of capital, not the up and downs uh, in the stock market. So Rob, as Jason just mentioned, you know, there's a lot of volatility out there. So let's expand on that. Can you discuss how you look at valuations because right now, most advisors think that small cap equities are quite expensive. And, and you know, as a group, uh, they might not be wrong. Small caps might be uh, trending a little bit on the expensive side today relative to large caps, uh, certainly looking more expensive than they, they've looked in the past. But again, we're not buying an index. There's not 2,000 companies in the, in the fund. There's not 150 companies in the fund. You know, there's 20 to 30 unique businesses in the fund. And I can tell you, if you could scour the world, if you could own businesses of any size, uh, any geography, uh, I guarantee you a large, a large percentage uh, of your fund, of a 20 to 30 name fund, would always be in small caps. Uh, that's where you find businesses with advantaged growth opportunities. Uh, and most importantly for us, it's where you find a lot of businesses that fly under the radar, that aren't covered by the analysts on Wall Street and Bay Street, that aren't making their way into the, the headlines of the Wall Street Journal or the, or the Globe and Mail on a daily basis. And that is a, a perfect environment for people like us that roll up our sleeves. Uh, so while small caps as a group uh, might be expensive today, when I look at our fund, absolutely the opposite. Uh, very, very good value uh, for the businesses we own today. Great. Jason, I wanted to go back to you for a second and just ask you, how, how are you specifically responding to the volatility that we're experiencing out there? Are you holding in cash right now or are you buying new names? Yeah, no, absolutely. We want to take advantage of any uncertainty or volatility to the downside. I mean, I think that's when we work best. 
um, some of our you know best returns were, were generated in the in the 08 09 period and at the time we didn't realize it because the market was down our funds were down um, but because we were able to buy things at wonderful prices during that time it led to substantial outperformance uh, in the years going forward so maybe not as extreme as the 08 09 period currently but um, there are certainly as Rob and Virginia have talked about, the wide breadth of stocks, there's easily individual companies that are down 70 or 80 percent um, that we look hard at and, and maybe you can find that, that gem in that pile and, uh, and take advantage of it. So uh, the cash was a little bit higher coming into the year, at least for my specific funds and higher in the other funds that Rob and Virginia are on. Um, but I think we've both slowly started to work that cash balance down as we've been able to uncover these sort of good companies that have been hit in, as, as the market sold off. And we think that sets up uh, unit holders really well for the next three to five years. Is there anything you're avoiding? No, I think uh, you know, we'll look at pretty much everything. I, the discipline is, is business management valuation. So you know, I think we'd avoid terrible businesses you know, with no competitive advantages or, or corrupt management teams. But I mean, other than that, I, I don't think we're ever going to say no to a sector. We, we want to keep an open mind uh, to any sector and, and go where, where the opportunities are. And same question back to you then, Rob, for, you know, in terms of the U.S. and global small, uh, small companies. Is it a hold, a buy? Are there things you're avoiding? Um, you know, I, I don't think we've had this many really good ideas in the hopper for a long time. Uh, I know we had a lot of cash build up in a, a very quick period of time as some of our biggest companies got acquired by other companies and, and converted into to cash in the fund. Uh, the way we work, you know, we really do roll up our sleeves and, and get to know a business inside out. So it takes time to do that. So it's taken time to put this, this cash to work. But in our U.S. small companies fund, you know, I think if we peaked at 45% cash, we're under 20% at the moment, and, and that's going down by the day. Uh, in Virginia, Jason and I, you know, both have, or all three of us rather, um, you know, have a, a hopper full of ideas that, uh, that we think could turn into investments in the fund. And Virginia, some of those ideas, I take it, are ideas that you brought forward as Asian opportunities potentially. Can you talk a little bit about what areas in Asia interest you? Sure. I mean, Asia is a very hot topic right now, and running global funds is hard to avoid that. Um, and regularly, all three of us travel uh, to Asia and the rest of the world to see what's going on really on the ground, meeting with management, talking to the peers and supplier. And that's actually a real benefit for this team running all three funds, that we have the Canadian fund, the U.S. fund, and the global small caps. So, um, the knowledge we gain from what we see on the ground can actually apply to, let's say, for Asia, not only Chinese company, we can actually get that exposure, you know, through a Canadian company, a U.S. company, or other global companies. Um, you know, exposure in Asia such as uh, infrastructure upgrade or the middle class. And we actually find that it's a better way to participate in some of the trend because the companies usually have a much broader portfolio and also uh, better corporate governance. I also understand you were there recently, so what kind of things did you pick up on your trip? Yeah, I was in Singapore at last November, and so definitely got to meet a lot of different companies, and um, there's a lot of competition there right now, so you really have to understand the industry dynamic. Um, in fact, I'm actually going to be living there for five months, uh, starting this September, uh, to really get to know the Asian region. Um, you know, not only that would give us a chance to learn about China, but also Southeast Asia, Japan, Australia, and just to really build up on our knowledge there. And it's important to be on the ground, I imagine. Yes, yes definitely. definitely. Well, I'll be staying in the Invesco Hong Kong office. Um, that, that's the benefit of, you know, having a global firm. Um, and then from there, that's kind of my base to visit other companies. Great. Well, you know, this is a good discussion about the opportunities, but Rob, I wanted to change gears a little bit and talk about your team. Um, the team behind the funds, Trimark Small Cap Equity, tell us a little bit about them and, and what are their strengths? Sure, and it's, it's funny, I've been watching a lot of uh, basketball lately and, and I watched the Miami Heat with their three superstars struggling to get it done again. Uh, and I think about the Chicago Bulls with their superstars and six championships in, in eight years. So what, what's the difference between those two teams? Uh, to me, it's chemistry. And uh, when I think about our team, that, that's really been one of the, the big benefits is the chemistry we have because we have playmakers. You know, and Jason, Virginia and I, you have three people who are very passionate about what they do, very competitive, 
uh, who have the intellectual horsepower to discern the, the differentiated or advantaged business from the also ran uh, and, and have the courage to make bold decisions and, and the conviction to, to stay with those decisions in tough times. But I think what's allowed our funds uh, to perform very well for, for unit holders over the last decade is the chemistry that we share. You know, we, we have a lot of mutual respect. We all genuinely like one another, believe it or not. Uh, we share a similar investment philosophy, and that allows you to sit across the table from one another and have great debates, fervent debates, you know, no-holds-barred debates. And it really gives you a fuller perspective on the businesses you're looking at. And at the end of those debates, each one of us uh, has the authority to go ahead and make a decision. So I, I think that's been the, the strength of, uh, of the funds, is to have playmakers who act as a team. And I think the fact that we all respect each other too really helps because we can sort of criticize each other and say, what have you thought about that? It sort of makes you stronger because no one takes those criticisms personally. You know, we, we do sort of, you know, Rob can say, what have you thought about this? Or Virginia will go, oh, I don't, I don't like that. And it really makes me think about my ideas and I think makes them stronger when you sort of get it, uh, those kind of ideas and criticisms through a, a, a group you really respect. Well, I, you know, and I did. I wanted to ask both of you your perspectives on what you think makes your team different than your peers in terms of investing in small caps. Um, I think in terms of the team, just the way the three of us work, um, we all focus on finding good, high quality company at a good price. So that's one thing that really set us apart. Uh, in terms of the portfolio itself, I think Rob alluded to it earlier, is the concentration. Um, we only have 25 to 35 stocks in the portfolio. And just to give you an idea of how unique that is, actually, um, a little while ago, Wall Street Journal and uh, Morningstar did a survey and they look at the uh, 4,800 funds out there in the U.S. and they only found 400, uh, sorry, 300 funds with less than 40 stocks. So that's one in 16 and we would be one of that. So that's why it's a very unique portfolio. Jason? You yeah, it'd be tough to add on that. I guess the, the two things I would think that sort of makes us different is one is the long-term focus that we have. Um, I was at a conference uh, this week, actually, and I was just talking to another investor I didn't know, but we were sitting at the same table at lunch, and um, we were both interested in the same company, and his main concern seemed to be, I like the company, I think it has a good asset, but I'm not sure um, it's going to work right away. I think it's going to take some time, so there's no rush to get into this. Just because you know, it wasn't going to work the next quarter or two and help his performance, he wasn't interested in it. But because we look out three to five years, I go, I'm not really, I don't really care if it's going to work in the next three months. I'm more interested in the next three years. And so I think that, that time advantage, uh, time arbitrage, if you like, uh, really helps us. And the other thing I think Rob touched on was the contrarian nature. I think it's, there's a company that we used to own that's it's been down about 75% in the last three or four months. And uh, we don't own it anymore, but um, you know, I think we're going to start looking at it again. And there's not many people that can sort of run into the proverbial building when something's down 75%. They just, that, that, that scares them off. So I think sort of having that contrarian nature, we go, that excites us. This is something to look for. It really sets us apart as well. So just to, uh, to finish up, I wanted to pick up on the, the timing issues that sure. Jason raised. You know, Rob, uh, why should investors buy small cap equities now rather than sitting it out <laughs> and waiting for the global economic recovery? Yeah. I mean, the same reason a discerning shopper buys a ski jacket in April. You know, it's on clearance, and, and you get a deal on it. Um, and, uh, and sure enough, every April, I know it's going to snow again in January. So I know I just have to sit there and wait for that snow to come, and then I can show my jacket off on, on the hill. Uh, and then that's what you want to do with equities. You want to get them when they're on the clearance rack. And, and right now, it's, it's, there are some wonderful businesses on, on the clearance rack. You're shopping at Holt Renfrew at 50% off. I mean, it's, it's a great time to step up and, and buy these businesses. And if you can just be patient, you know, wait for the economy to recover. And many of these, these businesses will, will make their own hay. They don't need an, an economic recovery. But if you can just be patient, there are wonderful returns uh, ahead. Uh, but most people don't have that patience. They, they, it's, it's a show me now type of mentality uh, in the investment world. So it, uh, it, it's hard to convince people to, to do something that is just so inherently uh, not in their, their human nature to do, but, but that's, that's what needs to happen. Very interesting discussion. Thank you all. All right. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Bill. Thanks.